Welcome to the Rocky Mountain MS Center's COVID-19 Q&A conversation. I would like to thank the pharmaceutical companies who have provided patient education grants to support this program. Thank you to Biogen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Genentech. Today, October 29th, we will be giving an update on COVID-19 and MS. The presentation features Dr. John Corboy. Dr. Corboy is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and did his neurology residency there with a fellowship at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He specialized in MS and neurovirology at the University of Minnesota Medical Center before coming to Colorado in 1994. In 1997, he founded the University of Colorado Multiple Sclerosis Center, now transformed into the Rocky Mountain MS Center at University of Colorado, a multidisciplinary group offering state-of-the-art care and research to MS patients. Dr. Corboy is co-director of the Rocky Mountain MS Center at CU and also the founding editor of Neurology Clinical Practice, the clinical journal of the American Academy of Neurology. We will be archiving this webinar on our website, www.mscenter.org, so you can replay it at any time. You can submit questions at any time by typing them into the chat window on your screen. We will answer as many questions as time allows. Today's presentation is for informational purposes only. Please note, we will only be answering questions related to MS and COVID in this webinar. If you have general COVID-19 questions, please visit your local public health website. All decisions regarding MS treatment and medications should be discussed with your neurologist. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Corboy. Great, Kelsey, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here today and uh, happy for those of, us, uh, those of you who are happy, uh, able to join us today. So uh, this is pretty informal. I'll only talk for at most 10 or 15 minutes, uh, hopefully less, and then we'll be able to answer as many questions as possible. Um, I would say that this is a constantly shifting uh, world we're living in right now. And some things that we may say today, we might have a different uh, view of in even just a few weeks. So uh, always keep that in mind as uh, this is a rapidly uh, changing area of medicine. I'm just gonna share my screen here. And uh, there we go. And let me go backwards here a little bit. And Make a little bit bigger, there we go. All right, so thanks very much for joining us. And I really just have a few slides um, with no particular um, um, uh, slide, graphs, figures, or other things like that. Just a few wordy slides here. Um, just a little bit of an update on COVID in general, in terms of what's going on in the world, uh, in terms of just cases and things like that. Um, as many of you know who follow the news, uh, we have nearly 50 million people uh, around the world who've been tested positive. That probably uh, greatly underestimates the people who've been affected by COVID as many people around the world, especially early, uh, early on, were not tested because there were not enough tests available. But uh, almost 9 million in the United States, and uh, we just broke 100,000 yesterday uh, in Colorado who have tested positive for the coronavirus. Uh, among deaths, you can see the numbers there. Uh, and uh, in all cases, worldwide, US and in Colorado, between about 2.2 and 2.5% of people who are known cases uh, have unfortunately passed away from this condition. Um, the trends have been increasing as of late. As I'm sure many of you know, uh, we're in what many are calling a third wave or surge. Um, uh, the earliest was in uh, March and April uh, when nobody knew much about this condition and it was spreading uh, pretty much unabated worldwide. Um, there was a, uh, another wave in July in the summer. And now certainly uh, since uh, probably the end of August uh, and certainly uh, from September through all of October with number of new cases daily uh, setting records over the course of the last week, uh, percentage of positive tests, that's an important one, uh, it is true that we are getting more cases because we're testing more people and we're having much better testing now than in April and May. But it's also true that the percentage of tests, which had been in Colorado down about 3% of all the tests that were done daily were positive. Uh, now uh, the trends are well over 7% uh, and the seven day trend is well over 7% on average uh, in the last week. 
Hospitalizations, including ICU uh, admissions and ventilator use are also up. Uh, just as a, a, for instance, or a comparison, uh, we had a little bit over, uh, I think we had 56 individuals in our hospital today uh, who were COVID positive. About 15 were on a ventilator. Uh, uh, earlier on, it was more than 50% were on ventilators uh, back in March and April. Um, and, uh, but at a low, two months ago, we had only 15 people in the hospital. So our numbers have gone up dramatically and that's true in the state as well. Uh, there are uh, well over three or 400 people uh, in the state um, presently in hospitals due to COVID. Uh, deaths always lag behind. And so a uh, recent increase will probably be manifested with an increase in overall deaths over the course of the next week or two, unfortunately. Uh, overall though, the death rate uh, in, in terms of percentage of people who are hospitalized has actually gotten better. Uh, and that probably reflects that many of the people now being infected are younger and generally uh, they do better and also just better care. We've learned more about how to take care of patients uh, who've been infected by the uh, coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Um, notably, a lot of this is happening in the upper Midwest. Uh, the Dakotas are unfortunately out of control. If you look at percentage of the population um, that is affected or infected, uh, it's, uh, it's dramatically high at over 100 per 100,000 in the uh, Dakotas right now, um, uh, greatly probably because of uh, decisions made about masks and other things like that. With regard to MS in particular, um, the most notable thing, and if you can just take one thing away from today's discussion and any other questions we have, is that in our patients with MS, the coronavirus acts pretty much the same as it acts in people who do not have MS. That is, the things that we know that are significant risks should someone be exposed to the coronavirus are the same in MS patients and non-MS patients. Age is a huge factor. Uh, roughly 9.25% um, of the population of Colorado is age 70 or over, yet that, uh, that group accounts for over 76% of deaths. That's a dramatic change and the change begins to be seen around 40 or maybe 50, it inches up. At 60, it goes up significantly. At 70, it goes up dramatically. So age by far still remains the largest issue, but level of disability, as is true with many infections, uh, disabled individuals, especially those who are wheelchair bound or bed bound have unfortunately a higher risk of a bad outcome as well. Obesity, smoking, lung disease in general, and other medical conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, prior cancer, all of those raise the risk substantially. But a significant question has been raised over uh, time, and not just in MS, but also in cancer patients, in those with rheumatoid arthritis, and those who take medicines for any of a variety of conditions as to whether or not either that condition itself or the medications that are used to treat that condition perhaps might alter the impact of the coronavirus on that population. And we know that some medications are actually shown to be beneficial. Uh, steroids, not one of the ones we typically use, but dexamethasone, one that we had to use, um, for those of you who might be a little bit older, may remember that there were a couple of times in the last 20 years where we couldn't get solumedrol as a steroid to treat MS attacks because there was a, a national shortage. One of the companies that made it had um, trouble with their plant. They couldn't produce it well. And we used a lot of dexamethasone then, which was taken orally. Uh, and so uh, that's been proven to be helpful in severe infection at, at dramatically about a third less uh, mortality for people with severe infection. Uh, others that might be beneficial are interferons such as Avonex, beta serum, uh, Rebif, Plegrity. Uh, those are, uh, the interferons are being actually studied as therapeutic agents as add-ons uh, in uh, coronavirus infection. And I mentioned IL-6 meds. Those are meds we don't use very often or at all in multiple sclerosis, but for those of you who may have neuromyelitis optica, a second line of agent is uh, tocilizumab or a Temra. And um, this has been studied directly as a treatment for uh, the so-called cytokine storm in late uh, coronavirus infection, where there's significant uh, disease uh, throughout the body, not just in the lungs. Um, but the biggest concern is whether, then whether or not there might be some medications that could in fact be detrimental because of course, many of the medicines we use may alter or suppress the immune system. 
And um, the most recent data from this suggests there might be a slight increased risk, about a twofold increased risk of hospitalization, ICU admission, or use of ventilators with rituximab or opalizumab. There's no apparent in increase uh, effect on death. And uh, these were compared in a large registry that was reported uh, recently uh, from many countries, over 1,200 patients. And um, uh, there was this modest increase that was seen if there was a correction for age and disability and all of those other things as noted. Um, uh, for most of people who are young, otherwise without other conditions, non-smokers don't have lung problems, et cetera, this likely is a very small increase overall. For example, um, if the overall risk of death is 2.2% uh, is or 2.5%, the risk in younger patients, say a 30-year-old, is actually quite low. It's, it's well below one in 100. And uh, so doubling uh, a low risk of maybe one in uh, five, to maybe one in 250 is really a small increase, but still is uh, notable. Um, so we view, we view this uh, potential effect as a relatively small and overall, uh, much less an impact from age or disability, which have a, a much larger impact uh, if someone is exposed to this uh, coronavirus. So if you are considering changing or stopping medications, please discuss this with your healthcare provider first. Um, it may be the appropriate thing for you, um, especially if you're an older patient with uh, significant disabilities and other comorbidities, maybe especially if you're a smoker. Um, and perhaps also noting that the benefits of all of the medications that we use probably diminish as people age. And when you're weighing a risk benefit analysis, perhaps uh, being on a less immune suppressing drug may be more appropriate, or even perhaps being off the drug. As many of you know, we're, we're doing our discontinuation trial on individuals who've been stable for a prolonged period of time and have reached uh, at least age 55. But please, if you're considering changing or stopping medications, uh, do not do anything until you have an opportunity to discuss that with your healthcare provider first. It may be a good idea for you. It may not, uh, may not be a good idea for you based on many different factors not just whether or not there's a small increased risk associated with one or more different medications. Another issue that will be prominent, hopefully coming soon, um, is vaccines. Um, there are quite a few vaccines being studied around the world. Some are that, that are very specific to one country, like there's vaccines in Russia that are really only being tested in and or used in Russia. Uh, but many of these are being studied in many different countries. I'm not sure of the total number of vaccines that are under study, but I think it's uh, around 20 or so. There are four or five big ones in the United States that are being studied with, again, large, well-known um, pharmaceutical companies that are specialists in making vaccines participating in these. Um, and uh, they need to show effectiveness and safety. Uh, and there are a number of different ways that can be done. Um, uh, and we'll see over the course of the next several weeks to months uh, what will happen. Uh, but I think the fairest thing to say is we're not sure when not only will a vaccine be shown to be safe and effective, one or more, but also we have to remember that they have to be then made. And many of the vaccine makers are actually making vaccine product right now with the assumption that they will be shown to be beneficial and safe and then they'll be available immediately. Um, and that's where some of our tax dollars have indeed, indeed gone with this uh, warp speed approach to the vaccine production. Um, of course, there's a risk that some of those may not be safe and effective, in which case they unfortunately will not be useful. But that is one thing to actually show safety, effectiveness, have the actual vaccine available, and then you have to distribute the vaccine, obviously, to many different locations around the United States and the world. And then in addition, finally, you have to actually inject these into the arms of people. All of these, uh, as far as I'm aware, will be injectable medications. Um, and there may well be more than one that is found to be safe and effective. Um, but they may have variable safety and effectiveness. Maybe the first one that comes out of the gate shows maybe 50% effectiveness, but it's very safe. Um, but maybe one that comes a month or two later uh, could be 70 or 80% effective uh, and equally safe, or maybe not quite as safe, um, not sure. They should all probably be pretty safe, 
none of these should be live vaccines. Uh, we worry about live vaccines with MS because we know that some live vaccines, especially yellow fever vaccine, may kick off MS, may actually make MS uh, active again. Uh, and uh, none of these are, are like that though. Most of these are what are called subunit vaccines, vaccines where you take only a piece of the virus to stimulate the immune system against the entire virus. Some are, are acting different ways, but none of them will be live vaccines. But they may have variable safety and effectiveness and how someone might choose to use one or wait for a different one, uh, that's gonna be very complicated and we'll have to have more updates over time once uh, vaccines become available. But likely we will not see a vaccine until at least uh, that's widely distributed, has to be broadly distributed so it's beneficial to the entire population so we can finally hopefully get rid of wearing masks and we can go back to the movies and restaurants. Um, but it has to be broadly distributed and beneficial in the population before we'll really be able to go back to having what we think of as more of our normal lifestyle. Um, another issue related to this is that some of the medicines that we use that alter or suppress the immune system may alter the effectiveness of some of the vaccines. Uh, you need your immune system in order to have a response to a vaccine. Uh, that's in fact what you're doing. You're stimulating the immune system. And uh, of course, we don't know with the coronavirus vaccine because there's not one been available to study this yet. We actually had plans and had discussions today to actually um, put in some grants to actually study responsiveness in our patients and all of our patients, all ages, all levels of MS, all types of MS, all types of medications, uh, so that we can understand this a lot better. And uh, we'll see if we can get that funded and hopefully learn something that is important uh, going forward because we may need to worry about vaccination every year like we do with uh, the flu. Uh, or it may be that, uh, that we are able to suppress this substantially enough that uh, we are able to eliminate this similar to what's happened with say polio or smallpox. Uh, but the effectiveness may be lowered perhaps again with the uh, anti-CD20 drugs, rituximab and opalizumab and now opatumumab based on vaccine studies with other viruses and, and other uh, bacteria. And also perhaps Jelenia, Fingolimod may also have a lower response and perhaps some of the other medications as well. But quite a few of the medications we use, there'll be absolutely no impact whatsoever on a vaccine effectiveness. So we'll see going forward, uh, but it's unlikely that uh, being on any one of our drugs would, uh, would make it more dangerous to take a vaccine. So once a vaccine, one or more is available and is shown to be safe and effective, again, if it's as long as it's not a live vaccine and you're not allergic to any of the products in the vaccine, um, there'll probably be a strong recommendation at that time that people get vaccinated, uh, but we'll see. Um, we're a little bit ahead of ourselves. So I think that's all really that I had to discuss. Let me uh, take my screen share off there. And I'm happy to take questions. Um, for those of you who sent questions in, thank you very much. We'll try to get to those. And uh, Kelsey's gonna try and moderate uh, with the uh, questions. So uh, Kelsey, why don't you fire away? Let's see if we can't uh, get some answers here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Corboy. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. We are unable to give specific medical advice during this webinar. If you have questions relating to your specific treatment plan, please discuss those with your neurologist. I would also like to encourage everyone to check out our COVID-19 education page on mscenter.org. We have previous update uh, webinars featuring Dr. Enrique Alvarez with COVID information, several lifestyle resource webinars on mental health in times of uncertainty, the importance of leisure and how to stay physically active during COVID-19, telehealth tips, and a resource guide that includes links for everything from COVID information, food supply resources, uh, mental and physical health links, and a wide variety of fun and unique entertainment activities that are pretty much all free. Um, as we see questions coming in, I'm going to group similar questions together, and I appreciate, Dr. Corboy, you actually hit on several of the ones that were already sent in, so that's great. Um, we have some folks wondering if we know um, why we're seeing this increased uh, risk with the B-cell therapies. Is it 
Um, does the diminution of B cell counts pose any risk um, other in terms of either con contracting the virus or creating long-term um, effects? Uh, could B cell depletion interfere with the activation of the cytokine cascade, thereby providing some protection um, from the more fatal outcomes of COVID-19? Okay. Yeah. All good questions and, uh, and certainly linked together. And so uh, thanks for uh, linking those up there, uh, Kelsey. So um, uh, all of the different medicines that we use for MS fall into classes. And we probably have about 10 different classes of medications, the interferons, the glutamorestate like Copaxone, uh, the anti-B uh, B cell therapies uh, like these and others. Um, and they all have different mechanisms of action. And because of the way they work, uh, they are more or less likely to uh, more broadly suppress or alter the immune system or less likely to suppress or alter the immune system. In addition, the duration uh, that they might do that and the permanence with which they might do that is very variable. So for example, the most permanent form of altering the immune system is to have high dose chemotherapy essentially and follow that with stem cell uh, therapy to replace the immune system. Um, that permanently alters uh, the response and along the way people are actually quite immunosuppressed and, uh, and could have significant uh, problems with their uh, ability to fight infections. But um, most of the medicines that we use are relatively more short acting and only have transient effects. And the anti-CD20 molecules are sort of in between. They have prolonged effects and that's why we only have to use them every six months uh, or perhaps even less. Uh, but they do have a, a, an effect that may even outlast that um, and, uh, in, and may even continue after there is a return of uh, some of the B cells from the bone marrow. Um, it's not exactly 100% clear which particular responses, be they the production of antibodies or be they the production of certain cellular responses such as T cell responses that are most relevant to what happens with the response uh, to an individual's response to coronavirus. And, um, uh, but it is clear that the effects of B cells are quite broad. They can affect many different parts of the immune system. They're somewhat of a traffic cop and they direct a lot of different aspects of the, uh, of the response. Um, to a coronavirus or any other virus or any other bacteria should you be exposed to that. And I'm sorry I'm walking around for those of you because I'm not sure I'm still being seen right now. So hang on. I'm gonna check my phone to see if Kelsey's talking to me. Um, so, okay, have you guys been hearing me the whole time? Yes. Okay, good. You, uh, Kelsey froze there for me, so I wasn't sure. Um, so uh, it's not 100% known, but the B cell does affect what we call humoral immunity with the, with the antibodies. Um, and they also affect responses that are so-called cellular responses, including the T lymphocytes. And the T lymphocytes direct a lot of activity against viral infections. So it's probably a combination of different factors. Um, and... Um, some of the medicines we use, for example, Copaxone and the glutamoracetate family, they have very specific impacts and they really don't, um, they don't deplete or alter or somehow generally suppress the immune system at all. And so medications like Copaxone are highly likely to be very safe. And in fact, they've proven to be safe. But several of our other medicines, which are also not so um, broadly impacting the immune system, have also really been shown to be relatively safe. And so for example, the study that showed that the anti-CD20s um, perhaps had the small increased risk of some bad outcomes, they were compared to Tecfidera and to Tysoprate, two pretty effective medications, but ones which don't uh, really generally suppress the immune system 
And so we've really not seen any impact at all. And we frankly wouldn't expect to see any impact with those. So even though uh, they could have significant effects, uh, specifically uh, in the case of Tysabri, for example, where you only block certain white blood cells from entering into the nervous system, um, you really don't see a lot of broad other infections. And we have not seen any significant risk with, in fact, the uh, impact of coronavirus. So I hope that, did that cover most everything, Kelsey, on that one? Yeah. Um, someone was mentioning that uh, the article talks about the increased risk of um, ICU and hospital care. Have there been any studies um, so far of the ongoing long-term neurological symptoms, if those are also oh. uh, increased risk? Well, that's a good question. So thanks for bringing that up. So um, uh, there has been great interest in so, so-called long haulers, like the long haul truckers, um, who um, seemingly recover from their uh, impact from the coronavirus. But then there are a variety of different types of ongoing symptoms. In one early study from Italy, uh, something like, uh, I think 45 or 50% of people who were hospitalized, so these are people who had gotten pretty sick, uh, uh, those who had gotten hospitalized, uh, three months later, were still having symptoms and multifocal symptoms uh, and, and in the nervous system specifically. Um, people have had uh, a lot of problems with fatigue, uh, a lot of problems with um, um, just their brain, brain fog is a term that is commonly used. Um, in addition, there have been a small number of cases, as uh, Kelsey mentioned, I edited a journal and we had several, we've had, we had numerous uh, case, uh, case reports, submissions, especially in March, April, and May, and uh, several uh, focus, for example, on Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, that's acute demyelination, similar to what we see with MS, but in the peripheral nervous system, the nerves that are already out in your arms and legs, as opposed to the brain and the spine. So there can be acute neurological syn uh, syndromes that are delayed, you know, even a couple of weeks after someone's recovered. But more commonly, it's these long haulers. And um, there has been no data so far, if I'm understanding the, correct, uh, the question correctly, no relationship that I'm aware of between any particular medication and uh, the likelihood of having one of these long hauler kinds of outcomes. But the long haulers can definitely affect lungs, heart, kidney, um, and also nervous system. And there are individuals who've uh, had uh, very significant vascular disease, including strokes. And those individuals will clearly have some prolonged impact in their nervous systems uh, if they are unfortunate enough to have a, a, seri a severe impact like a stroke. So, um, but no linkage that I'm aware of to any particular medication. Has there been any study or links um, between a high JC virus index and COVID? Uh, that's also a very good question. Uh, not as far as we're aware. The best linkage for uh, a, a so-called high index when someone is presumably having a large response against the JC virus. And for those of you who are not familiar with the JC virus, the JC virus is a, a virus that's common in the environment to which many of us are exposed. It typically causes no even discernible disease, not even a runny nose in most people who are affected by it or infected by it. Uh, but like many viruses, does not leave your body. It just sits in your kidney uh, and perhaps your bone marrow, but under certain conditions, uh, this is your immune system, such as having cancer. Um, we saw this a lot in HIV, uh, especially in the early 80s, uh, but also with drugs that suppress the immune system, we can see that the virus may leave your kidney and may go up to your brain and cause a very serious infection called PML or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. With some of our uh, medications, especially Tysabri, this is a substantial risk. And uh, the amount of antibodies in your blood to the JC virus have been linked to a higher risk. So if you have a low amount of antibodies, a lower risk. If you have a high amount of antibodies, a higher risk of developing this still somewhat rare complication. So we know that other drugs will do this as well. Um, there have been a small but significant number of cases with Chilenia, with Tecmodera. I think there's been a single case report with Ocrevus, a single a uh, case report with Abagio. Um, but with all these other medications, there has been no linkage 
to a higher amount of antibodies, a so-called higher index, giving a higher risk. And specifically with the, uh, with the coronavirus, um, there has been no interaction that we're aware of um, that somehow the coronavirus may alter the response against uh, the JC virus. Uh, there's no interaction that we know of um, that would somehow alter the risk in someone who may have a low index and then somehow might develop a higher index as somehow uh, as a nature of a response uh, to the coronavirus or in some interaction with the coronavirus. So no known interaction that we're aware of. Um, and can you quickly kind of give an overview? Um, you discussed kind of the increased risk for folks on anti-CD20s. Um, have there been any results of folks who are not on any DMTs at all, if there's any difference in outcomes or um, infection rate? So um, the, uh, the broad answer is that if you are on no medication, your outcomes have been very similar to those who are on medications in a big sense. Um, and so um, the, the, the biggest challenge has been that many people who are not on medications are perchance older. Uh, and so the outcomes in general, if you look at those who are not on medications are worse, but that's mostly because they're older. When you correct for age and for when you correct for a level of disability, uh, being off of a medication is neither beneficial uh, overall, nor is it, uh, uh, is it worse. So um, once you correct for those things, especially for age, um, uh, being off of medication disappears as an issue. We've had a couple of questions come in on um, the status of treatment recommendations. Um, is it safe to get infusions? And if folks are um, continuing their DMT like Ocrevus, uh, what, do you have any additional recommendations if they're working in person um, and sure. you know, not able to social distance quite as much? Absolutely. So this has been perhaps the most common question that we've had to address over the course of the last seven or eight months. And um, uh, the simple answer is always what we say in medicine is it depends. Um, and uh, uh, one thing it could depend upon is uh, what is the risk in general in the environment? If, uh, if this was uh, something that was wildly spreading and you came into contact with somebody you know, 25 feet away from you and had a 100% infection rate, uh, boy, leaving the house would be tough to do for anything. In addition, if this was a very severe outcome, say like the Ebola virus, which has a mortality rate that is dramatically higher. I mean, if you're exposed to Ebola, it, that's a very bad, very bad thing. Even young, healthy people die. Um, and so, uh, it might depend on those kinds of factors. And I would state, you know, in a broad sense, um, coming to an infusion center or coming to our hospital uh, or our infusion center generally is quite safe. Um, very early on, uh, we didn't really know. We weren't doing a lot of screening at the door. We weren't doing temperature screens. Uh, but very shortly, uh, you know, even in, still in March and certainly by April, uh, we and every other um, hospital or infusion center um, introduced a number of mechanisms by which screening took place. And so that when we really open back up uh, more completely, it's say end of May going into June, um, getting an MRI scan really is quite safe, getting an infusion, getting your blood drawn, going to see the doctor. Those are really actually quite safe. So that's, if you can maybe take another thing away from this, uh, please don't not get care because of that concern. The vast majority of people who have been infected with this virus have been infected outside of a hospital. There have been almost no um, hospital super spreading events, if you will, or outbreaks inside hospital. There's been over 1,100 what are considered outbreaks in the state of Colorado, um, where you've documented that multiple people got infected at the same time. They've all been parties, college events, um, early on, it was, you know, people when we still had restaurants open, um, people on, you know, maybe on public transportation where there were many people crowded together. Uh, the hospitals have actually been quite safe because they've had a lot of personal protective equipment and they've been taking measures to, uh, to try to help keep people safe. 
But the real answer is it's going to depend. And as I alluded to before, if you're a young, healthy person, if you're a 30 year old, and let's say you're on ocrelizumab, um, you don't smoke, you don't have diabetes or high blood pressure, you haven't had cancer, you're not obese, your overall risk uh, is quite low if you are exposed. But in addition, if you further reduce the likelihood of exposure by appropriate social distancing, wearing a mask, um, and uh, cleaning your hands uh, appropriately, uh, but often, um, then uh, your overall risk of exposure is uh, quite low. And in addition, if you are exposed, you are likely going to do well. And if, even if you're on ocalizumab, that's a very modest increase um, uh, over uh, someone who is uh, not on ocalizumab, for example. So that kind of person, the likelihood is that they could uh, they could, I wouldn't say not, not with impunity, but they, they would be very likely to do well just continuing their routine infusions. It might be, oh, in addition, one other part of that. And then also a younger person like that is at much higher risk of having acute inflammatory disease activity for which Ocrevus would be beneficial. So you always have to weigh on the other side of the equation is what's happening with the MS and what's the benefit of the drug at that time. At the other end of the side, the other side of the equation, say, what if someone is 65 years of age? Uh, maybe they have primary progressive MS. Uh, maybe they uh, also have diabetes and they were a smoker in the past. Um, maybe they're a little bit more disabled, maybe not wheelchair bound, but not getting around as much as they used to compared to uh, before they were diagnosed. Um, in this case, this is an individual who is at a higher risk uh, should they become exposed. And in addition, the benefit is demonstrably lower. And in fact, at age 65, we really don't have any data that any medication is beneficial, uh, mostly because patients like that, unfortunately, have been excluded from studies with most people having a maximum age of 55 in all the studies that got approval for the medications. So it's a, it's a demonstrably lower benefit uh, because we know from uh, a variety of studies that age does matter with response to the different medications and the risk would be higher. See, the equation for that person would be very different. So it's always gonna depend on the individual and their circumstances, what are their exposures, et cetera, and all the personal things related to them and to the medications. Um, and the important thing is, please don't stop or alter or change your medications without speaking to your provider first, uh, because it's, it's a complicated discussion. It's not something you should do by an email chat it's something that you really should have a full discussion where you get all of your questions answered and then make the best informed decision. Uh, thank you, that's a really thorough answer. Um, also wondering if there is increased risk um, depending on the, the time of the infusion. So if you're on Ocrevus or Rituximab and you're three months into an infusion, um, is there any data on that? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. That comes, the time that comes up most commonly is when someone's going to have an operation and they say, oh, how can I plan you know, my operation around the timing of my infusion? And this is true for Tysabri, alentuzumab, uh, uh, or, or any of the anti-CD20 agents, they're all infusions. And uh, the answer is not quite as clear as we'd like. We don't have data in our population, our, our types of patients, um, that you're at more risk of infection right after the infusion or right before your next infusion. In the cancer literature um, with rituximab, there's some reason to believe that you might be at somewhat higher risk of infection right after the infusion. Uh, and so um, it's not great data, I would say though, unfortunately, it's very difficult to get that data and to have controlled data that would really answer the question properly. So I'd say it's sort of a, a very mild amount of data and not great data, um, but it's all in the cancer literature and none in ours. So what we generally tell people, and I'll go back to the surgical question, is just aim for the middle. Um, if you aim for the middle, any sort of early events related to what could be an effect right after the infusion will be diminished. And in addition, uh, more importantly, if there's any effect on wound healing or any effect on rate of infection um, after the operation, you'll still have plenty of time before you get your next infusion. 
Uh, we do know that some medications do affect healing. Steroids, for example, you literally, the skin, when you put the skin together after an operation, if you're on steroids chronically, it will not, it will not sew together. Um, and the skin is more friable, it's more easily breakable. So some medicines really clearly do have an impact uh, in that context uh, and have um, a relative immediate effect. But we don't know explicitly with ocrelizumab or rituximab where we have this long window, the six month window. And I would say with alemtuzumab, there's a year long window. You take five doses of alemtuzumab and then you take nothing for a year. Um, uh, in that context, we have a little bit more data. Uh, not many people are using alemtuzumab, only about 1% of people are with MS. Uh, but um, probably the risk is higher the closer you are to the infusion. Um, Tysabri, uh, natalizumab, probably is um, probably irrelevant. Um, in the case of Tysabri, uh, it's a forked molecule. It binds to a molecule on the outside of white blood cells, and it just blocks it. That's all it does. It just blocks it. And over 12 to 16, or maybe really 8 to 16 weeks, if you do not take another dose, it'll just fall off, and the white blood cell will sit there and be active. Uh, but the majority of the white blood cells remain blocked, and when you take the drug every four weeks, which is the standard way that people take it, um, uh, very few of those molecules have, have fallen off at that point. Almost all of them are still being blocked, and so there shouldn't be any impact with natalizumab tisabri at all. So it might be different for different drugs, um, but there's not a perfect answer also. That's a, that's a really long answer for not a, not a very good answer. Um, we've had a couple of different variations on the question of if someone with MS gets COVID, are there um, any different considerations? Should they look at going to the hospital sooner? Are the treatments, um, should they look for different treatments? Well, that's a very good question. So um, uh, we do know that um, uh, some medications, for example, might have an impact on the effect of different medications. Many of those are long-term effects, but we know, for example, that one of the risk factors for developing complications uh, of what I mentioned before, the JC virus and PML, that brain infection, especially on Tysabri, if you've previously had chemotherapy, um, your risk is higher. So exposure to the virus is one thing in the case of the JC virus. Uh, exposure is one. The amount of antibodies is another. The duration of use is another, but exposure to a prior medication is different as well. So we do know that the risk can change based on a variety of different other factors. Uh, I'm not aware of any factors like those that would... Um, suggest to someone that their treatment might be different or the outcomes might be different uh, should you um, get exposed to the coronavirus other than the ones we've talked about. So for example, if you've had cancer and you've had cancer chemotherapy, uh, your risks are clearly higher of having a bad uh, coronavirus outcome. Um, but whether or not you would go to the hospital and get an actually different treatment, uh, for example, would, um, with the steroids, as I mentioned before, would they act differently? Probably not. Uh, there have been other approaches. Uh, remdesivir is another antiviral medication that has been shown to have benefit. There's no evidence that I'm aware of that it acts differently in individuals who um, um, may have had some prior uh, illness or take a different medication, such as you know uh, maybe Tecfidera or maybe Tysabri or maybe Ocrevus. No evidence that I'm aware of that you would treat differently with any of those kinds of things uh, based on anything related to MS or to MS therapies. Um, I know in the article, we recommended that folks get the flu shot. Um, how, how do people know kind of to tell the difference between the flu and COVID? Um, and at what point would you suggest uh, reaching out to a doctor? Right, uh, that's a, a very poignant question right now. Um, the great fear uh, for many uh, going into uh, the fall and winter season is that, of course, that's the season when we start to have other infections become more common. People are more inside. Uh, we know that uh, being inside actually um, uh, is a, 
is one marker of increased uh, infectious capacity uh, because people are more closely together um, and they're more closely together for more prolonged periods of time. Those are absolutely risk factors for many respiratory-based infections such as the flu and such as uh, the coronavirus. So um, uh, they can be difficult to distinguish from one another. They can both cause fever as a prominent sign, but that's probably more likely as an issue with coronavirus. There's not a lot of, there's a low grade fever with flu for sure. Um, cough tends to be a little bit more prominent um, with the coronavirus than with the flu. Um, um, they both can cause some nausea and vomiting, um, but that might be a little bit more of an issue with um, the flu. The biggest one other than fatigue that is a crossover between the two, um, uh, as, as well as fever, is likely um, going to be just uh, aches and pains, muscle aches, headaches, super common in both. Uh, and so it can be extremely difficult. And it's actually not just the flu. There are other viruses as well. There are other coronaviruses. Uh, there are other rhinoviruses that even just cause the common cold uh, that can also mimic um, uh, can also mimic these uh, other viruses, especially coronavirus. So the main thing is to have a broad level of, of, of concern uh, if you develop what appears to be a viral infection uh, and it has primarily uh, fever and cough are the two most prominent symptoms, but, but any other symptoms, uh, you can have manifestations that do not have fever and cough and still have other manifestations that look more like the flu or, or look more like other infections. And so just have a very high index of suspicion. And uh, the first thing to do is probably call the primary care doctor and just tell them what your symptoms are. Uh, and then that, uh, that person will be hopefully able to uh, come up with a plan. It might be different in different places. Um, and uh, uh, in general, uh, many of the primary care doctors though, um, oftentimes do not want sick people to come to their, um, to their waiting rooms because they have you know, small, relatively congested waiting rooms and they want to make sure everything's safe for everybody else. So if you, uh, the, two, the two cut points are then, are you sick enough to go to say an emergency room or urgent care, uh, or should you just use general, um, general measures such as fluids, Tylenol, Advil, rest, um, unless you are having uh, a major concern, the major concern with the coronavirus by far is shortness of breath. Shortness of breath implies that this is no longer an upper respiratory tract infection, but it has gone down into your lungs and is a lower respiratory tract infection. Um, and so shortness of breath should always prompt at the very least a discussion with the primary care doctor or really perhaps going to an urgent care center. Um, one thing that has been notable um, that have many emergency room nurses and others have commented upon is that people are known to come in, they'll say they're a little bit short of breath, they'll put them on a pulse oximeter and measure their oxygenation with their finger, uh, and they'll be running you know, 92. Most of you sitting at home are probably you know, 97, 98, 99%, and they'll be 92, but they'll be comfortable you know, they'll say that, you know, yeah, I feel a little short of breath, but I'm, I'm okay. And they're, and they're consistently 92, 92, 92. Uh, and then they may crash relatively rapidly. Um, and uh, any shortness of breath, shortness of breath is really not seen uh, really much with the flu. Can you get pneumonia as a complication of the flu? Absolutely. But it would be the same answer. If you're short of breath, you should definitely be seen. Um, most people with the flu, do not really get a significant infection. Who's more likely to get a lung infection that would prompt something like that? Older people with disabilities and other comorbidities, just the same as it would be with anybody else with any other viral infection. So a, a major trigger would be a, a high fever, uh, would be um, anything that limits your ability to eat and drink, uh, and especially shortness of breath would be a major reason to seek urgent medical care. Um, other than the flu vaccine, are there any other vaccines um, that would be important to get at this time? Um, and then kind of a slew of questions about vaccines. 
um, sure. and DMTs, how they interact, um, uh -huh. and you know the uh, interplay between an individual's uh, ability to mount a defense on the vaccine versus um, community herd immunity. Right. Uh, so um, the one other one, especially for older individuals, that would be important to get in general and as related to respiratory infections is the pneumovax. Uh, pneumovax uh, um, are really the, uh, the, new, the pneumococcal vaccines. There's really two. They cover uh, uh, pneumococcus is a bacteria. Uh, it is a common cause of pneumonia, hence its name. Um, and it has many different call, what are called serotypes. And uh, Pneumovax covers, uh, I forget the exact number, but somewhere between 10 and 13 of the serotypes. And then um, I believe it's called, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the second one, uh, but it covers a number of the other um, uh, serotypes. That would be one that would potentially be important, especially for people over the age of 60. Um, because it can also be related to a superimposed bacterial infection that can occur anytime you get any um, viral infection of the lungs, um, but also could be confused for coronavirus and can be confused for the flu. Um, there are no other major ones that I'm aware of um, that would be a major concern for overlap with the flu and with the coronavirus. Um, other ones that are common as people age, though, are, of course, the shingles vaccine, Shingrix. Um, that will have no relationship whatsoever. Uh, so uh, that's a, another question that may be some people's uh, question is, if you get the flu vaccine, does that either help you with coronavirus? The answer is no. Will it hurt you with regard to the coronavirus? The answer should be no, but there's not really any data on that. Uh, it should be independent, uh, except that... Um, it is conceivable that if you have one infection um, that could impact your ability to have a different infection. We know that individuals who get any viral pneumonia, it can convert is a term or can uh, be complicated by a secondary superimposed bacterial infection because you'll have a small amount of damage in the lungs. Bacteria exploit that small amount of damage. And so, um, they can then find crevices and little nooks and crannies in your lung and set up shop. And it's very difficult for your immune system to get rid of those. So anything that causes one infection makes you perhaps more in the lung is perhaps more likely to make uh, a complication uh, with a second infection, be it bacterial or be it a virus. Um, with regard to vaccines in general, was there, was there a specific question there, Kelsey? Or um, I wanna make sure. Um. I kind of just how they interact with the various DMTs and will um, folks particularly on the anti-CD20s be able to um, produce enough uh, antibodies or will they have to rely on herd immunity? Yeah, perfect. So um, uh, the answer is we don't know yet for the coronavirus vaccine because of course no one has been studied yet. And that's the study that we proposed uh, uh, that I mentioned about a half hour ago. Um, uh, there, there will likely be a response by people who take all of the medications um, that we use for MS to the coronavirus vaccine and for that matter, the flu vaccine. But there will be some folks, and this is true for every vaccine, uh, who have minimal response to a vaccine for any of a number of reasons that we don't, uh, mostly don't know. And, uh, and then in addition, you could have a diminished response. So you can develop a certain level of antibodies, but maybe a lower amount of antibodies compared to someone who's not on drug X. So in the studies with vaccines, um, uh, with, as I mentioned, with fingolimod, gelenia, with ocrelizumab and rituximab, ocrevus and rituxan, um, there have been some vaccines which have had diminished responses, either no response, which can happen with anybody, uh, at a higher rate or a diminished response. We just don't know about the coronavirus yet because every virus and every vaccine will be unique. And so um, uh, I, would, I would not really wanna hazard a guess with any one particular medication uh, just because this is a brand new virus and we don't know which vaccine we're gonna be talking about. Um, so uh, the bigger issue for me will be 
is it safe and effective? And effective is going to be measured many ways. And this gets to the herd immunity issue. Um, one of the things that you can measure is the so-called R0. What is the uh, rate at which if I'm infected, if I walk into a room with all of you there, what's my likelihood of infecting how many of you? How, how often can you spread it? If you spread very rapidly, um, then you need to have very good herd immunity. You're gonna have to have 70, 80, 90% of the population covered in order to actually be able to say you have herd immunity. On the other hand, um, if you have a virus or a bacteria that really doesn't spread very easily, and it's, you know, it's, it's not really um, uh, particularly spread respiratory, for example, um, your herd, herd immunity uh, needs to be much lower. Uh, you can probably protect the population substantially, maybe if only 20, 30, 40% of people are, uh, are going to be um, I needed to be uh, vaccinated in order to get herd immunity. Uh, and I would say vaccinated or perhaps have a natural infection. Um, right now, if we have uh, uh, whatever number of people in the United States who've been infected, um, that number is uh, uh, gonna have to contribute to the vaccinated population as well. And the two together would uh, constitute herd, herd immunity with the assumption that the immunity is persistent. And that's another issue as to whether or not it's persistent. There has been some evidence that back the uh, nat with natural infection, you may see that immunity wanes even over a few months. Now, there was some data recently that uh, actually suggested that the immunity lasted longer than that. Uh, so I think that's one of the things we still need to learn about. And herd immunity will only work uh, if you continue to maintain that. And so... Uh, we know with the flu vaccine, you have to take it every year because there's, there's so many different subtypes that they are going to uh, be different in different parts of the world in different years. And so um, one of the reasons why there is failure of the flu vaccine, and, uh, many of you may have said, well, God, I got the flu vaccine last year. I still got the flu anyway. Well, it could have been a different strain, uh, influenza A or B, or even a subtype. Uh, or for whatever reason, it could have just failed in you. Um, uh, or um, perhaps other things about the virus itself. So um, uh, herd immunity is a little bit more complicated, but the estimates are that with the ability of this virus to spread, which is pretty high, um, and with many asymptomatic carriers, that's another aspect, if only the symptomatic people are gonna be able to infect you, uh, then, you, you know, then you could just isolate them you know who's gonna infect you and you're okay. But if an asymptomatic person can infect you, uh, then your numbers have to be higher because there's no obvious reason for you to believe that they're gonna be able to infect you and uh, they're gonna be more likely out in the world with the possibility of infecting you. So the, the recommended number today, and this could change, is that we're probably gonna need at least 50, if not 70% of people to have been infected or to have gotten a vaccination to develop some level of herd immunity. But a lot of that is um, still not perfectly clear. And that number could be a little bit lower, but it also could be a little bit higher. So um, how is that gonna impact on someone on drug X versus drug Y? What that really means is that whoever you interact with better make sure they get a, a vaccination. That's what the herd is. It's your herd. You need your herd to help you out. And if it's people at work, people in your family, uh, whoever it is, this is the reason you do it. You do herd immunity for not just yourself, but you do it for others as well. And we have one time for one more quick question. Have you heard any talk that folks with MS will be prioritized once a vaccine is available? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very important question. And um, um, the ethics of that are challenging. Uh, who, who deserves to be at the front of the line? Um, and um, it's pretty clear, as I've mentioned several times, um, who is at greatest risk. Uh, and we've seen it, unfortunately, with these horrible you know, decimation of people in nursing homes, for example, tremendously high risk. Um, and so uh, one part of the ethical argument 
is um, who is at highest risk uh, just by demographic features like age, um, disability, et cetera. And then the other is exposure. Um, and certainly uh, people who are um, out in the world by definition as part of their uh, occupation and what they do in society are at higher risk of exposure. So you can imagine first responders, police, fire, EMTs, physicians, nurses, other people who um, uh, care for those uh, who are coming into the hospitals and getting sick. Um, uh, but it's an imperfect formula. Um, and uh, how that gets done will, um, will tell us who we are as a society, I think. Um, if it's uh, rich people who can control access to it and they're the ones who get uh, uh, vaccinated first, that will be um, challenging from an ethical point of view. Um, I think the main thing is you got to base it on uh, who is most likely to benefit, who is most likely at risk. Um, and then this becomes a larger question when you say, well, we're making all these vaccines in the United States. Uh, what about India? Uh, what about Sub-Saharan Africa? Where are they on the list? Um, uh, the poor countries of the world. Um, you know, that's a very large ethical issue. Uh, that's a humanistic issue. Uh, and uh, the ethicists are going to be the ones who have to figure out how that all works. Um, but I'm sure there will be some inequities, uh, especially like I mentioned. Um, you know, uh, uh, Britain is going to have perhaps their vaccines. They're developing some there in Oxford with AstraZeneca. Will they, will they have greater access to that one than, you know, people do in Nigeria? Uh, perhaps they will. Um, and um, how that works out over time uh, will, will matter. I would say the things I mentioned are very important. And at the time the vaccines become available, where are the hotspots in the world would surely uh, hopefully play a role so that you can try and quench this, not just in your backyard, but everywhere. But if you have any ideas I'm interested in, you should pass them along to, uh, to uh, whatever ethicist lives in your neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Corboy, for your time this afternoon. Thank you, everyone who submitted questions. I just wanted to let you know as well, we will be broadcasting our next virtual education summit on November 14th. Um, you're able to submit questions for that as well when you register. Um, we'll have a regular Q&A session and we will also have another COVID update on the education summit. So thank you guys and have a great afternoon. Thanks for coming, everybody. Stay safe. Wear your mask and wash your hands and socially distance. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you. Bye-bye.